But at any rate, um, Jacob talks about, you know, he's worked at camp. Long before I met Jacob, again, a long time, I remembered hearing about camp for junior high students, for senior high students, but especially for the junior high. Uh, people talked about what a neat experience it is. They talked about how wonderful, you know, they had fun activities. They talked about the life change that you would see in the students. Talked about camp. And I felt like every time I turned around, there was at least one person talking about camp adventure, the junior high camp, the impact ministry through camp, and you just heard about it and heard about it. And I had never gone to camp as a child, or at least that camp. I had never had any experience with it. And so finally, when I volunteered to help with our youth group, they said, Devin, do you want to go along to camp? And I'm thinking, well, on the one hand, yeah, I've heard so much about it. On the other hand, no, it could never live up to all the stories I've heard. So I went along and I helped as a volunteer with camp one year. And this is not to brag. If you hear this as bragging or me being proud, you're missing entirely what I'm saying. But I want you to know I have helped every year since then for 10 years, volunteered at a week of camp and usually two weeks because I go to a senior high camp. <clears throat> I'm telling you, there's no way when I talk about it or when Jacob Johnson talks about it or when anyone else talks about it, there's no way that can match up you hearing it, to being there. There's no way you can really understand what happens in a week of camp, nor would you want to understand everything that happens in a week of camp. There's no way you can grasp how you can see a student change through a week just by hearing about it in 10 minutes, five minutes, a half an hour. There's no way you can comprehend the work that God does in that time unless you're there or you've been there. It is one thing to hear about it. It is another thing entirely to experience it. And again, just to share a short story, not for the purpose of bragging in any way or being proud, not at all, but this touched me. It, it made an impression on me. Last year, again, my 10th year of going along with camps, so there have been so many students over the years, some that hope I say, some that might say, I hope I never see that man's face again. And some that, you know, have great memories and remember being in the cabin and all sorts of shenanigans. By the way, am I on? Yeah. Oh, good. So happy about that. Um, but I was, sitting, I was sitting in the senior high camp this last year. We were in the opening session, everybody's gathering, we're figuring out what the week's going to look like and what we're going to be doing, and they're giving their introductory talks, and I recognized the student in front of me. I recognized him because he had been at junior high camp with me. But again, there are a lot of students I recognize, and I have no idea if they remember me or what they think of me, and it does not matter, but I was like, I remember that kid, and that's neat. As we're sitting in the lecture, and you know, they encourage you to get to know the people around you, he turns around and his face does this. I thought, okay, he remembers me. And when it came to a break time, I was sitting next to Ben Beeks, and he shook Ben's hand and he shook my hand. He's like, you guys! I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> you know, which you guys moment <laughs> are you thinking of? He said, you counseled together at Camp Adventure. You, I was, I was in your cabin. I said, yeah. And I remembered his name. That is tough for me a lot of times. I remembered his name. I said, Riley, right? He's like, yes. He said, boy, I have to tell you, here it comes. He said, you guys made such an impression on me. He said, I can't even explain to you. That week at camp, that time together that we had, he said, it was a lot of fun, and I learned so much. Thank you and just grinned from ear to ear. And the remainder of the week, if we were crossing paths, our group was one, going one way, their group was going another way, we were coming together for lunch, if you saw Ben and I, there was a high five waiting for us. And at the end of the week, he was not in my group at this camp, but he remembered me from before. At the end of the week, I said, it was good seeing you again, Riley. And he put his hand out, and he shook his head, and he just gave me a hug. He says, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. That's great. 
It's one thing to stand here and tell all of you about Riley. It's an entirely another thing to have been there with him, to have spent that time with him, and apparently, even through my blundering ways, I made an impression on this young man. There are several things that you could say this about. That's my experience. That's my example. It's one thing to hear about something, or maybe see a picture of something, but it's another to experience it yourself. I've heard this about the Grand Canyon. I've heard that no matter how many pictures you see or how many descriptions, until you stand there at the edge of the Grand Canyon, you cannot know. Does that seem true? Anybody been? Yeah. Would that, would that be true? Okay. I've heard this about fish stories. It doesn't matter what you hear. Unless you were there, it doesn't count. Jake, is this true? Yes. (laughs) People who have changed their ways. You've heard people say that, or you've heard others talking about others, and really they're a changed person, and your first response every time is, yeah, right. Unless you meet them, and you see they're living differently, and it just blows your mind. I bet the parade for the Chicago Cubs was really something. I bet it was tremendous. You can read about it. You can see pictures about it, but to be there... I will never know what that was like. That was probably the celebration to end all celebrations in Chicago. I don't know. I know what I've heard. But it just doesn't compare. I'll bet it's just nothing compared to to being a part of that. So I want to ask of you, which is more powerful? Which is more powerful? Simply having second or third hand information about something or having first hand experience with it yourself? Which is more powerful? First-hand experience, are we all agreed on that? Okay, pretty well. Let me ask the following question then. If we're going to make an impression on someone with our faith, if we're going to make a statement as a church, which is more powerful? Simply to state what we believe, or to talk about what happens, or to let others experience that? Which is going to be more powerful? Seeing it, experiencing it, being a part of it. Brings me to a really interesting passage. A really interesting passage. I love the parables that Jesus teaches. I love the stories about things that Jesus does. I love in the Gospels where you learn about Jesus. But this particular story is just so interesting to me. John the Baptist, in case you don't know, John the Baptist was kind of a precursor, announced the coming of Jesus, and told people they needed to repent, and he was kind of a weird guy, ate locusts, dressed in camel's hair, baptized people in preparation for the Messiah. That's John the Baptist, okay? John the Baptist, in Matthew's Gospel, had done enough preaching and baptizing out in the wilderness that he had his own group of disciples. That's right. They weren't Jesus' disciples. They were followers. They were people that were believing in, that were looking up to John the Baptist. He had his own group of disciples, of followers. He must have been a powerful person. But he always preached and always pointed to the coming Messiah. There's one that's greater than me. There's the Lamb of God that's coming to the world to take away the sins. There's one that you need to be ready for. Make way, okay? John the Baptist was the precursor, but he had developed this following, and John eventually was put into prison. John's disciples are like, well, we have a conundrum now. John's in prison, but he keeps talking about this other guy, and I'm going to assume uh, from the descriptions across various Gospels, he had a decent number of followers, and they probably had a sit down and said, what are we going to do? Like, do we jailbreak John? Who's got dynamite? You know, (laughs) Do we go and we protest? Do we keep following him? Do we listen to him? What about the other guy he's been talking about? Do we go and look for him? Maybe he's not around yet. Who is the other guy he's talking about? John is put in prison. His followers have to have some kind of question running through their head. Maybe did we have the wrong guy entirely because he's in prison. And in Matthew chapter 11 comes again to me what is a terribly interesting story. They want to know what to do. They want to know who to follow. These disciples of John want to know, like, where do we go? Okay, we believe the message you're preaching, John. Where do we go with it? 
And here's what you find. Again, Matthew 11, starting at verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his twelve, his disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their towns around Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the Messiah, he sent his disciples. John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? So there it is. John did the preparation, did the baptizing. Again, he's in prison and he sends his disciples. Go and ask this Jesus fellow. I've been telling you he's coming. I've been preparing. Go and ask Jesus. Find Jesus. He's of Galilee. He's always dressed in white robes with a purple sash. I'm kidding. But he said, go and find Jesus and ask, is he the one to come or should we expect someone else? And listen to the response. Please don't miss this. Look in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, verse 4, whatever you need to do, but listen to this response. This just gets me. These disciples, they go, and they ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replies, go and report to John what you hear and what you see. Go and report to John what you hear and what you see. Go, Jesus says to John's disciples, go back and tell him not what you believe or not what's written or any of that. Go and tell them what you have experienced. And he elaborates, the blind receive sight, the lame walk again, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus says, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. But go and report to John, what was it again? What you hear and what you see. Jesus could have said, I'm the Messiah, go tell him that. And that would have been true. And it would have carried some authority. Jesus could have said, Look, this is what's written about me. Have John reread the scriptures because he missed something. And if you guys study the scriptures, you've missed something. Jesus could have said so many things that they could have then relayed to John or figured out for themselves. But his answer, in essence, was look around. You want to know if I'm the one? You want to know who to follow? You want to know if I'm the Messiah that's promised? Look around. Apparently, they were with Jesus long enough to experience some of this. Jesus was teaching his 12. Just before that, he was out in ministry. He probably said to them, Look, that man was a leper and is now clean. Look, that man was blind and he sees you. Look, that guy over there, he's been healed of his disease. Listen to some of the teachings I'm passing. What do you see? Jesus gave them basically the freedom to say, You decide. But what do you see and what do you hear? What are you experiencing? And that is the most powerful testimony that you can have. In essence, that's the answer Jesus gave them. He goes on to explain all the good things if you read the remainder of the passage that John did. And he calls out people for not listening to John even more. He says, John did all these things. And John, you know, he told you I was coming and the baptisms and all that. But... John was a very good man. Jesus even says that in the passage it follows. John was a great man. But what do you see here in my presence? What have you witnessed? What do you hear going on? What have you experienced? Go tell that to John and take that as your evidence. Is this actually the Messiah? The question's big. I mean, it's loaded. Don't miss it. Is this actually the one who is to come into the world? Is this the promised one? Is this the Redeemer? Like, in all of history, is this the figure that everything's going to hinge on? (coughs) Jesus says, go tell them what you see and what you hear. What you've experienced. There's a guy who's uh, really big in the business world right now. If you follow the business world, He's got a lot of ideas and telling companies how to do their best. 
His name is Simon Sinek, and he says what a lot of businesses are missing, and you can apply this to the church. He says, but what you're missing is telling why you're doing what you're doing. He says, the problem is not what. He said, people have too much information on what you're doing. People know if your company makes X that you're making product X. If you're selling Y, then you're selling product Y. They know that. They said people aren't going to decide what to purchase or how much to spend or how to invest in based on what you're doing. They want to know why you're doing it. He says that's more important than what you're about. Why are you about that? John and John's disciples were looking, why should we believe this Jesus guy is the Messiah? That's what they wanted to get to. Why should we follow him? Why should we believe this is the one? Why do we think this is the party we need to be with? Why is that? Get to the why. And Jesus says, you should believe it. You can get behind it because of all that you see happening. Here's a big distinguishment that I want to make. It is important for us to have beliefs. It is important for us to have doctrine. It is important for us to have theology. It is important for us, you know, that'd make a great series, Scary Good Theology. No, it is important for us to have our system of beliefs. But our system of beliefs will never give anyone a why. They will never convince anyone they should follow. They will never inspire someone to be different what we believe. What we do with those beliefs what plays out in our lives, what they see us doing and what they hear about us, that will make a difference. I could have said, my name is Devin Cook. And he would have said, my name is Riley to that camper. And I believe Jesus is the Son of God, Riley. And I believe that He is the best moral foundation we have. And I believe that He teaches us the most about heaven. And I believe that Jesus is going to return again. And I believe, and I believe, would never have done a thing for Riley. But a week of living the way camp is set up, and spending a week with Ben and I, again for good and for ill, made an impression on his life. Sometimes in the church, and I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings, Sometimes we have the problem of wanting to go as far as what we believe, which again is important. You have to know what you believe before you can do anything. But the people in the world are not asking, what does the United Methodist Church believe in Brookston? What does the Federated Church believe in Brookston? What does the Church of Christ in Brookston believe? They want to know that it's making a difference in our lives and they want it to make a difference in their lives. And when you make a difference in someone else's life, you've begun to build something. Do you know what that is? It's a legacy. When you make a difference in someone else's life, you begin to build a legacy. When you make a difference in someone else's life, you turn them just a bit. You open up a window of a new possibility. You begin to influence them with the hopes that someday they will blossom, they will open up, they will see, and they will go and do. And because of that, someone else's life will change, and it's like ripples. You throw the stone, and then there's a ring, and it just keeps going out. That's the idea. If you want to build a legacy, you start with actions, and you start by letting people experience what it is you believe. And today on All Saints Day, we celebrate again those that have gone before us. And I bet, I can't bet I'm a Methodist, I guess that any one of you, if I asked about the names that we named, the people that have gone before us in faith, you would tell me a story of how they personally affected you, of something that they did for you of how they influenced your life, or maybe even you saw them influencing someone else's life, and that inspired you. Or maybe they influenced someone that turned around and influenced you, but you would tell me something about what they did, and then it got around to what they believed. 
So the questions that that leaves me with are, what will people say of Christians from this age? Broadly, you, me, the Baptists, the Catholics, I mean, name, what will people say of Christians from this age? There's a group of people, will they say of Christians, that had a great system of beliefs. It was airtight. Everything seemed solid. I had no interest because I couldn't for the life of me tell they did anything. Well, they say about Christianity from this age, that was the age of sound belief. Well, they say of Christians from this age, (coughs) well, they kind of gave us doctrine to go on, but as to how to act, how to be, and how to integrate with the world, we'll forge it from here. And that'll be the legacy of our generation. What will people say of Christians from this age? And of course, I would ask, what will people know of Brookston United Methodist Church. It's a very similar question to what John's disciples had. Do they know, do people in the community know, are they aware if you say the name, do they know Brookston United Methodist Church is a group of believing people because they're a church? Yes, that's obvious. They're going to come with the question, why should we be on board with what they're doing? Why do I want to be a part of this community of believers? Why do these people that say they follow Christ, and I'm not even sure I get that, why do I want to be with them? What's special about them? What do they do? I mean, what good is their faith? I don't think we live in an area, possibly an age, but certainly I don't think we live in an area where there are people that have not heard the name of Jesus. I don't think we live in an area where the Bible is something people would go, what? There are four Gospels that tell about Jesus Christ and if I want to know more, I can read about it? I don't think that's the question anymore. I think the question is, why should I care about what's in those Gospels? Why should I care about what they believe? And their testimony, their turning, the impact you can have on them is going to be based on what they see and what is happening among us not on what we believe, not on that we're a church or we're not a church. It's going to be on our actions. I was with Zoe on a field trip this week, and we went to the Idle Jord Museum. And it's an interesting museum, but there was one thing the tour guide said that I hadn't heard before, and I thought it was fascinating. There was, all of the kids pointed this out, that's one of the great things about children, like they just don't miss stuff. <laughs> It just jumps out at them, and they're not afraid to ask or call it. I'm chaperoning, and they have these figures in one section, and one is standing on a turtle's back. That's different from any of the other figures because there's a turtle underneath it. I've seen this twice. I went with Eli, and I went with Zoe. I've seen it twice, like, But kids see that, and the whole group that was with me, I think every last kid said, Why is that one on a turtle's back? I'm like, uh, I have no idea. Quick, make something up. Turtles were evil and the Indians crushed them. That's probably not a good answer. No. The tour guide, thankfully, was there. The tour guide said, well, that's how they believe the world began. I'm like, fascinating. I didn't know that. So their belief system uh, across this particular tribe, but several tribes, was that the earth began because they knew that under the waters, again, think back to Genesis in our account, this is just what they believed. They knew that under the waters that were present everywhere, there was land. But they needed to dive way deep down and get the land, and then they had nowhere to put it. It would fall back into the water. So, so this is what they believe, that turtles, there was a turtle with its strong shell that said, you can put the land on my back, and we will start to build land so they could dive deep under the water, get the land, and put it on this turtle's back, and that is how things were built. <clears throat> And two things about that story stuck out to me. One, uh, the tour guide concluded by saying that turtle isn't being stepped on. In their belief system, that turtle is honored to be used, that civilization stands on it. Honored to be used, that other people used it for a foundation. Honored to be there, that the legacy of all of humanity was built on this turtle. I'm not telling you to worship the turtle this morning. Here's what I get from this story. 
One, imagine that as a concept. Honored to be the foundation that other things are built on. Again, that's a legacy. Honored to be that person that steps into the mess, that lends a comforting arm, that's there to clean up, that's doing, and that begins to change someone's life, and it builds on. And sometimes you take heat for that, and sometimes people say you're full of it and your religion's stupid, and you take a lot, and there's a lot of pressure, but you are honored to stand there and be the foundation that something greater is built on. Boy, that's a model for All Saints Day. How many of the people that we named were honored to give up a bit of time to help out? Were honored to make a sacrifice each morning to teach a Sunday school class? Were honored to carry the burden of people saying, I think you're stupid and what you believe doesn't hold any water, and to continue to love those people anyway? I love the image, again, not what I believe for creation, but I love the image of the turtle saying, I will hold that on my back, and something better will be built on it. That can be us. Letting a legacy be built on the foundation of what we do. And the other thing that struck me is we don't really believe that anymore, do we? About the way the world was created. We don't believe that people swam down beneath the surface and pulled up dirt and built it on a turtle. Does anybody here still believe that? I'm not trying to be insulting. No. Because what we've experienced something different. We have seen and we have heard explanations that make more sense. We don't buy into that because there's nothing that we've seen that would support that. So I ask again, what have people seen of you? What have they experienced of this church? What would they report back to say, you know what? We believe that they're on to something. And we don't even know what all they believe yet, but there's something there, and it's powerful. Because that's what John's disciples had to go with for Jesus. Jesus said, go and tell them what you've seen and what you've heard. So I hope those questions kind of rest with you. I hope that you wrestle with them a bit. What will they say of Christians in this age? What will they say of Brookston United Methodist Church? What would the report be? But I want to leave you with this image. I want you to imagine with me, and if it helps to close your eyes, close your eyes. If it helps to write it down, write it down. I want you to dream this with me. Imagine a world where future generations, future generations of people in our church, future generations of people outside of our church, Future generations of people who don't even get what we believe that say that sounds like nonsense, but imagine a world where they're inspired by what they see and they experience from us. Where they can even be skeptical of the things that we believe and say, I don't know, that doesn't even make sense. But the way that you are doing this and the reason you're doing this that makes sense to me. Imagine that type of world and imagine if our faith, not just in what we proclaim, but acted out, inspired people in that way.